Coming up next on the Wetfly Swing Podcast. I do prefer more often than not to, yes, swing a, a dual density line simply to ensure that I know my fly is down uh, versus, you know, me having to really manipulate my line, meaning, you know, say casting more back upstream, giving it a huge mend with a floating line and even like stepping with my cast to really sink it down. I know with a dual density head, I'm working smarter, not harder. That was Kinsley Scott on the groove and the benefit of dual density lines, taking a swing back to the click attack and get an update on OPST, Steelhead, and Trout Spay. Welcome to The Swing. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how's it going today? Thanks for stopping by the show. One easy way we love that you can support this podcast and support other anglers out there is to share an episode, uh, either this one or one from the past. If you have an episode, maybe you have a favorite episode that's helped you out, uh, easy way you can click down in your app, find that show episode number and click that share button, send a text and get it out. Thanks in advance if you had a chance to share this week. Today's episode is sponsored by Dalton at uh, Country Financial who thrives on helping families and community members through the power of education and proper insurance coverage. The unexpected will happen, so it's always best to make sure your assets and life are protected. You can check out Dalton right now at wetflyswing.com slash country and make sure you are protected today. Today's episode is sponsored by Eastern Idaho's Yellowstone Teton Territory, Idaho's most renowned zone for fly fishing. From the Henry's Fork to the South Fork of the Snake, and all the high alpine lakes and streams in between, Yellowstone Teton Territory provides anglers and other outdoor enthusiasts with all the information they need to plan their next big trip. You can visit wetflyswing.com slash Teton right now to get the full list of outfitters, lodges, fly shops, and all kinds of inspiration to get you started on your next trip to eastern Idaho. That's Teton, T-E-T-O-N, wetflyswing.com slash Teton. Kinsley Scott is here with an update on swinging flies for trout. We find out which setup she loves for trout spay out of Montana and uh, and why the poly leader is a key with uh, with her setup. And we also find out and kind of take a dive into her setup for uh, chasing and swinging flies for big Montana rainbows. Getting back into one of my favorite rivers for steelhead and another reminder about Montana. Time to get back to Montana. Here we go. Kinsley Scott from ksguideservice.com. How you doing, Kinsley? Doing great. How are you? Good. Good. Thanks for uh, making some time today to dig into, uh, To we're going to go into spay, I think, pretty deep on some of the smaller, maybe some of the compact, shorter stuff. Maybe we'll talk a little larger as well, but I want to talk steelhead and trout today, which is uh, which is going to be fun. You're out in Montana, but I know you've done a lot of, a lot of the West Coast steelhead stuff. So we're going to dig into that. Before we get there, take us back really quickly to how you first got into fly fishing, and then we'll take it into all the spay. Yeah, uh, fly fishing. I actually grew up uh, gear fishing. Um, not actually, it's funny, funny story. My really the culmination of my fishing happened at a singular point <laughs> in my life. Uh, I was nine years old, and my family and I we were on a chartered trip for marlin and tuna off the Big Island of Hawaii, and my dad ended up fighting and landing a 539 and a half pound Pacific blue Marlin. Hmm. And after an hour and 45 minute long fight, uh, it being nine years old, right? It was a super impactful moment. So for me, it had a very profound and obviously lasting, (laughs) lasting effect. So that kind of translated into, uh, me not only fishing, but, you know, spending time outdoors that, really growing up, um, I grew up in Montana and grew up in the mountains and it kind of just all went hand in hand. So translated into fly fishing, really not until high school, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Um, and what a hack job that was. So, Mm -hmm. (laughs) so then, uh, worked at a fly shop 
and through high school learned a ton. And then it really kind of took off once I moved over to Missoula to go to college in 2008. Um, mm-hmm. Then I started really learning how to, you know, like properly row a boat and, and guide and really, really progressing as uh, a guide and an angler as, as well. So. And when did the, um, when did the steelhead bug hit you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Being landlocked in Montana, we yeah. fish can't make it over mountains, but uh yeah, uh, I started traveling for steelhead over to the Clearwater in 2009 or eight, I guess. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the Clearwater being a big river and that whole culture, uh, you know, I was just immersed into it. And I <laughs> learned how to make a wind cutter line. It was terrible. Oh, God, mm-hmm. it was bad. Uh, 15 foot rods. Uh, you know, the whole kit and caboodle, I actually had a, a G Loomis GLX uh, nine weight, 15 foot rod. Uh, that was my first rod and yeah, made a terrible line and, you know, about threw my shoulder out every time I was trying to cast it. And, but it was, it was cool. It's kind of baptism by fire. Um, so that's kind of where it all progressed. And then from there, I started traveling to Oregon, actually, uh, kind of got into to that scene. And as I started traveling more, learning more, um, my rods got smaller, so did my heads <laughs> mm-hmm. and my casting got better. And yeah, it's kind of the, the progression. So. Right. And you, uh, and you did a lot, I mean, you, OPST, right. You've, you've been working, fishing a lot of their stuff over the years. Yeah. Yes, I have. Yeah. And it's been great for, not only steelhead, but uh, trout as well here mm-hmm. in Missoula. Um, I do a lot of trout spay instruction, swinging, um, and it just translates perfectly. Uh, it's OPST is built for those that are looking to get into spay casting, swinging. Uh, it's super user friendly and just lends itself great to really any application of swinging so mm-hmm. what's the setup for uh for trout if you're swinging for uh you know browns i guess let's just take browns out out there what, what would be like the length of the rod what would be your typical uh space setup for them yeah so i i run a 3111 imx pro it's a g Lumis rod and then on that i throw a commando head uh OPST head. And I want to say my OPST commando is a 225. I can't even, Mm -hmm. I think that sounds right. Don't quote me on that. I'd have to, I'd actually have to go and look because I, we switch out heads all the time and somewhere in that ballpark, but I do commando head. Uh, it's a floating line. Uh, you know, for our trout out here on free stones, we aren't swinging, you know, big, heavy flies by any means. So we're mm-hmm. able to, like in August, for example, we're swinging a lot of times small, wet mayflies. So we don't need to, to dredge, you know, we're swinging like shallow riffles. So we can get away with like light floating heads, light tips and light flies as well. So it's, it's super fun. Mm. And what, in the 3111, what's that? What's the length and weight of that? Uh, remind us again on that. Yes. It's an 11 foot 11 inch <laughs> three weight. Oh well, yeah. 11 foot, 11 inch three weight. Yes. That was a, a Tom Larimer, um, marketing tactic. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but it rolls off the tongue nice. Right. So like in spay, right. in spay, you always put the weight followed by the foot followed by the inch. So 31. And so technically it would be a 31, 11, 11, but we call it a 31, 11 or for that series, the IMX pro, you know, 4111, 7111. It, yeah. yeah. Just a marketing gimmick, gotcha. pretty much. Right. Yeah, <laughs> you, so it's yeah. 11, 11. Yeah. So it's 11 foot. Yeah. So it's almost, it's almost a 12 foot rod, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. And then, and then you're matching that up with a, yeah, the commando head, which is a pretty short, what, how, how, what's the length of that head? Or I guess I'm not sure if they, there's a lot of variation in the lengths of those. There is, but uh, OPST is 
always going to be shorter than most all heads. And I want to say they're uh, smaller grains. I think if you're throwing it on a 3111, like a 200 grain, I think you get up into like the 13 and a half foot uh, mm -hmm. head lengths. So they're a little bit shorter, but they're more uh, condensed. So you still have that that grain window. It's just in a, a, a shorter package, uh, so to speak. Right. Yeah, yeah. shorter package. Good. And then you can... And the idea being there is that you can, if you needed to, you could turn over big flies. But here it doesn't sound like with trout, you're really, you're doing, well, I guess at least in the summer, you're doing a lot of smaller stuff. Is there a, how is that swing when you got, is the commando head a pretty thick line? and then, Or how does that swing? Because it's not like you're fishing a scandy line, right? Yeah. Yeah. It swings, um, it swings great. I mean, it, it certainly does depend on your, your application, like, uh, you know, that's where your, your tips come into play too. Like when I'm swinging, mm. you know, smaller bugs, uh, like our mayflies in shallow riffles in August. Uh, and I want to get that, that, yeah, that head away that has a little bit bigger bulk to it could be a bit, mm -hmm. bit cumbersome if I'm fishing very shallow water to, to spooky fish, uh, you know, that are posted up in call it two feet of water feeding on mayflies that are hatching, right? I will absolutely put a longer tip on and then a longer leader just to give mm. a little bit of distance um, yeah. in between. Yeah. The That's shooting right. head and then the, the yeah. fly itself. Yeah. That's right. So and then the tip you, and what would be a tip you'd put on? Would you put on like a, like a 10 foot tip or seven foot or does that vary with when you're doing, we're thinking trout? Um, Trout. Yeah. I'd say like a 10 foot poly leader for that application in like shallow riffles because I don't want to go I don't want to get hung up in the riffles itself um mm -hmm. but you know if I was to say swing more of a what you would consider like a traditional uh like small streamer a sculpin things like that that's more of what we do in the springtime when uh our sculpins start to move around uh again here on our freestones based out in Missoula um we're uh, shoulder seasons for our string, our um, swinging, so streamers I would use, you know, more. It's more indicative of uh, springtime, and I would say, you know, you could get away with a seven foot, uh, yeah, tip. It, you know, springtime. Just a floating, just a floating tip. You then I would start to get into sink rates. Uh, mm. You know, again, depending on the application. Like if you're swinging a big inside run, um, you know, then you could start to get into types um you know sink rate like five six mm -hmm. yeah gotcha okay so yeah it is it would be similar to we were just up in actually up in ohio last week fishing for steelhead alley and we were using some cool like mostly scientific angler stuff but i, I think it's all similar and like 11 and a half foot rods we had like the sketch the uh the skagit short one of essays lines then we'd have like a 10 foot of t of not t but of um Oh, I think we were using a mix, but like three, five, it's, you know, with a little tip floating and then a sink tip on the end to get it down. So it sounds like actually for trout, there's situations where that probably would work pretty well. So where you're using kind of a lighter setup and, and those rivers over there aren't very swift. So is that Montana? I mean, I guess that seems like the picture you're painting here, whether it's early in the season, maybe springtime, the water's higher. Um, talk about that a little bit though. Are, how much are you changing up your tip throughout the year when you're fishing for trout spay? Um, I mean, again, you know, springtime for us here, um, our, our trout are hungry, ready and willing, right? Uh, our winters here in Montana on our free zones are pretty rough. Like currently the Clark Fork in Missoula is pretty much completely iced over with ice walls mm. that are already 12 feet high and it's not even December. It's not even well, wow. technically mid-December right now, but you know, and this is more indicative of like a normal quote unquote winter. When I was growing up in Montana, you know, it was always really cold and we've had some pretty mild winters in the last, I would say, five to yep. eight years. So this is more quote unquote normal, you know, mm. in, in my memory. So so our our fish have it pretty rough on our freestones. Um, we're building a great snowpack this year, good things, you know, in terms of, of winter flows. Um, so everything's looking great, but you know, our trout kind of get their butts kicked. Uh, it's going to be really cold 
And so anyways, springtime, fast forward, yeah, um, snow's melting, ice dams are moving around, and our trout are very hungry. Uh, there's a, not a lot of bug life until I would say, call it February, then we start to see um, some midges, some small blue-wing olives, things like that. Um, so you can get away with uh, swinging. You know, our, our fish are very lethargic, that's for sure. But in terms of, of tips, you know, I would say my progression has to do with the water temps and the temperature of the trout themselves, right? So as our waters start to heat up or warm up, I should say, then in the spring specifically, because then come summertime, we're strictly bugs. I mean, we have salmon flies, golden stones, you know, we're strictly dry droppers specific. So, so you're not swinging during, there's a period of time where you're not really swinging flies for trout. Me personally guiding. No. Um, oh, right. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm rowing a boat. Um, I do know people that do swing in the summertime and I'm sure that they do have success because we always do have, we have such an abundance of not only bugs, but then to, um, bait fish, so to speak, you know, sculpins, um, mm -hmm. fry, especially, especially in the summertime coming off of, uh, our cutthroat and rainbow spawn, um, post June, like post high water. So there's always an abundance of small fish in the system. So, you know, if you wanted to swing a streamer here in June, July, like once the water starts to drop, I am sure you'll have success. Yeah. Um, no doubt. I just am always yeah. guiding and never have time to go fun fishing. Yeah, because you're guiding. Right, right. And those, stre <laughs> <But> <laughs> those streamers, you would be fishing. I mean, you could probably put on a lot of stuff, but you could probably, with the typical kind of the intruder style, maybe buggier looking thing, would that work out there for a trout spay? Maybe a smaller, something like that? Yeah. And I would say for our rivers out here, you know, um, I would go smaller. I would never, yeah. I, I would never tell anyone, you know, yeah, throw this double articulated, you know. I, I, yeah. No, start smaller, uh, and all of this seems to always yeah. do great. We always have sculpin in the system here. Right, um, that's the thing, the sculpin. Yeah, so a yeah. so muddler would probably be some sort yeah. of muddler might be good. Totally. Or whatever. Uh, intruder, yeah, absolutely. Or whatever, yeah, you could throw on all sorts of stuff, something that might push water. Or Are you doing, Yeah. are you ever doing any of the surface stuff? Are you ever getting fish like, you know, where you're swinging stuff and they're coming up towards the surface? Yeah, October caddis yeah. season. Oh, right. For sure. In the fall. Absolutely. Uh -huh. It's a very short window. It's hit or miss, but uh, absolutely there's the opportunity for that. And it's here, it's very um, watershed dependent. Like, you know, for example, the Blackfoot, we have three big rivers out of Missoula. We have the Blackfoot, the Clark Fork and the Bitterroot. Those are our big three. Mm -hmm. um, and the Blackfoot has a great October caddis hatch because of the lithology, the, the way the, the river basin, so to speak. And plentiful October caddis. I mean, it is prolific at times. Um, not to say that they won't eat a dry fly either. I mean, it, yeah. it, it is go time on the Blackfoot. Right. Start to actually right. hatch. But yes. They're pretty active. Oh, yeah. But yeah, you could absolutely swing. I mean, we'll, for, you know, with a single hand rod from the boat, you know, I'll have clients like, oh, yeah, just let it swing out. Like, literally, <laughs> you know, forget mm -hmm. your dead drift. Just twitch it, move it, skate it. You know, so we're essentially swinging with a single hand rod out of the boat for all intents and purposes. So, heck yeah, you can swing surface. Uh, again, it's a very short window, but man, it is so fun. Um, right. And really, that's, you know, I think the only time of the year that I could think of a salmon fly hatch, you probably mm -hmm. could do the same thing. Um, the thing with that that would be really tough from a swinging perspective is. During our salmon fly hatch, our rivers are usually very high and it's very hard. The fish push up, you know, underneath willows. Um, they're going. Yeah, to, right. To get to them. Exactly. The food source. Right. So it'd be very hard to swing. But I'm sure if you could, you know, put all those puzzle pieces together. Yeah. It could be like the most lights out That's swinging cool. ever. <laughs> well, and I can imagine again, going back to the, I'm coming hot off this Ohio thing because we were yeah. up with Jeff Liske and he was. You know, he's got things dialed in. We were kind of doing that in some of these runs. We yeah. would cast out towards the bank, and then we'd basically kind of force feed the fly, like kind of almost a dead drift swing down uh -huh. and like push it into him, and then it would slide off of these 
these ledges. Yeah. And I could see that kind of working the same thing. If you had a salmon fly fish tucked up under a tree, you could probably make a cast close to the bank and then just kind of, and what you do is, right, you cast and then you step down into it. So yeah. you're actually dropping the fly. So maybe that, something like that might work. Um, wow, this oh, is absolutely. cool. So yeah. And October caddis, what, what is a fly? If somebody wanted to, if somebody's out there in, um, you know, September, whenever the October cast is hot, what would be a fly you would use to imitate them on the swing? I would, so for a dry fly, I would use a size four uh, elk hair caddis. And if you don't have a, a, an orange specific elk hair caddis, mm -hmm. grab a, like sometimes I run out of them, grab a, an orange Sharpie and just color the belly. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, right. Uh, that's a little, you know, guide hack. If you don't have the yeah. exact color, right. And bring a bunch of Sharpies that's and you right. can make any fly, whatever color you want. So, um, that's Perfect. what I would recommend for that. And then it's in terms of like a, a wet fly, honestly, again, a, a guide hack because come the end of the season, we're like, yeah, I have, that should work. Um, yeah. I would say a size four orange pats and what I would do a, a pats rubber leg or a, oh, yeah. a turd, right? I would trim sure. down some of the legs, leave the front antennae really long or the legs, I guess, serving as yeah. antennae. And then trim down the legs on the side. There's three on either side. Trim those down really short. And then you could leave um, you could leave the back legs longer, but be mm -hmm. sure to leave that front antennae to mimic the actual caddis and just swing a pat. Yeah. Uh, just swing it. Yeah. I mean, that would be the closest thing to an actual October caddis. Um, shuck or larvae in the the water that I could find in my box. But then too, you know, they always, you know, there are actual caddis pupae that you could go patterns that you could buy. And I'm sure with a bead head on it, that would crush for swinging. Right, right. With a bead. Okay. So, and then, so the rod you mentioned, like the 11, 11 or 12, do you ever, what, what would be the shortest rod you would use for swinging any of these, any of this stuff? Um, I mean, I've, I've fished the OPST rods. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. What's their line look like? I know they, I know last time I talked to, um, oh, we've done a couple of OPST episodes and I know, uh, we chatted about some of their new, they had, I think a year or two ago, they had this new rod. What, what do you know their line pretty well? Yeah. Yeah. Um, they, I'm trying to think they're two handed They're I think it's called the micro and it's the, I, I believe there are nine nine foot, nine inch again with that. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> nine, nine, right. Yeah. Um, nine, nine. yeah. And I, I know we have one in a three weight and they're super fun. Okay. Uh, you can fish it two handed or kind of use it just as like a, a single hand to, they're super mm -hmm. functional. They're, they're very fishy rods. You know, I mean, it's meant to be fished. Uh, it's more mm -hmm. of a tool, which is awesome. So you buy fished by meant to be fish. You mean it's not, you're not, not doing, it's not like uh, the casting, right? It's not focused on casting. It's focused on whatever you need it for as a tool, whether that's spay, single, whatever you have to do, like kind of commando style. Yeah, precisely. Yep. And being a little bit shorter too, you know, it's, it's great because you can really like tuck underneath, you know, overhanging trees a little bit easier than having that, that extra, you know, two feet on whatever it is, an 11 or 12 foot rod. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's a great tool to have to to fish. Yeah, precisely. Yeah, well, and that is short. Yeah, I mean that's yeah. nine. I mean shorter than ten feet, right? I mean that's yeah. and it has that rod has your full on. It's you could cast double handed. It's got the full um, bottom handle and all that. Yes, yes, it does. Yeah, and I think that's specifically for the the in the three weight. And then I think as you go into the four and the five, I think it does get a little incrementally longer. But uh, the three weight is a is a sweetheart for for trout. It's super fun here um, mm. on our gotcha. waters for sure. Right, and that's the typical for trout. You're going to be fishing the three three or four weight spay. Is that kind of the, usually what it's at? Yeah, for here for what I do application wise is what I would recommend for folks. Yeah, on a free okay. stone. Um, then you know when you get into bigger water, like going over to the Missouri, like where I'm from. Um, you know, I, I do prefer a little bit longer of a rod. Like that's where I would recommend to folks, um, the 3111 Loomis, the 4111 Loomis even, uh, it just gives you a little bit more versatility. Cause I do love fishing to, uh, 
Scandy lines over on, you know, the Missouri bigger water. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, who doesn't love casting? So there's that too. Today's episode is sponsored by Tokens Fly Shop. Tokens Fly Shop provides superior quality products at a great price. They have also a great YouTube channel that you can check out right now with uh, new fly tying tutorials each week. Tokens also has you covered if you're looking for unique in-house products, and they also support uh, many, many of the great brands out there that you know and trust. It's been fun connecting with Justin, the family, uh, over the years now, and it's it's been really cool, a great local fly shop. Tokens is also offering their fly tying box where they send out materials at a regular cadence where you don't even have to think of it. You just open the mailbox and there's your Togans pack. And I recently made an order through Togans and the experience is always perfect. They've got you covered if you have, ever have questions or need any help, whether that's a YouTube tutorial or connecting with them uh, personally. Since 2005, Togans has been over delivering on customer service and it's time for you to check out uh, Togans Buzz for yourself. You can head over to wetflyswing.com slash Togans right now to check out their diverse selection of products today. You support this podcast by clicking through that link to Togans online. That's Togans, T-O-G-E-N-S. Okay, back to the show. Well, let's round out the this this trout rod, and then we'll move into some other uh, stuff here, maybe on some of your guiding. But um, so we're talking about, you mentioned the 31, 11, 11, 11. So basically anywhere in that range between whether it's that really short 9, 9 up to the 12 footer. And then you got your commando head, which you could find the right grain weight. And then on the end of that, you said poly. So are you putting, is that your tip or are you putting an, another tip before the poly leader or is that the tip? That would serve as the tip in that scenario. Um, yeah. Yes. So, and then two to answer, I know I never did quite come back and answer your uh, kind of original question too of, you know, what in terms of my, my year in a season, what, what does my, my tip uh, scenario look like? Um, oh yeah. Yeah. So February, you know, fish are going to be very lethargic. Uh, so I'm probably going to fish a heavier tip because I'm going to be fishing deeper water because the fish are going to be cold and huddled up. So I'm going to be fishing deeper runs I might even switch out from like a floating head to more of like an intermediate head. Uh, OPST mm -hmm. makes what's called the groove. Oh, it's, yeah. Yeah. So it, it's incorporated. There's the groove. And what was that? There's the groove. They got the three things. They make it really easy to remember. What was that? What are they called? There's the, the well, the commando head. So hold on. Let me get my head around this. Yeah. The commando head, um, the smooth, the groove, right? Commando, smooth, and the groove, right? Oh, is that it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Is that right? Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I can't remember. Yes. I know they made it the smooth groove and the commando. Okay. Yes. I had to think about that for a second. Yes. Um, so the, the yes, the commando is the full floating, and then it goes all the way down into the groove, which then is that um, orange and kind of like an aqua blue color. And that then allows you to uh, incorporate... A, an integrated line. So it's going to help you sink your tip down um, faster, right? So then I would use that more in a February scenario when the water's still really cold, fish are lethargic, they're going to be down in deeper water. Then as the water starts to warm in the springtime, say then come March and we start to see some squalas, more bug life, more activity, I then will probably start to come up, meaning I will probably put on like a sink rate of, of a five, six tip versus like say a shoot. I mean, sometimes I'm even fishing T11, depending on the run, mm -hmm. like on the Blackfoot, you know, some of those really deep runs where it's a classic run, but man, it is, you know, to get to the belly of the beast, you got to go down. Uh, mm -hmm. Then, you know, like for example, then on the flip side, on the Clark Fork, where you're fishing these big insides, but on average, it's only four feet deep. But the fish then, as the water starts to warm, they start to become more active and move into different water. Then I'll start to fish, yeah, a five, six tip, maybe with a, a commando head, that floating uh, shooting head. And then summertime, again, in August, mayflies in riffles. I'm fishing pretty light setups. And in the 
fall swinging here when I am here and not <laughs> in Washington uh, steelheading, uh, I would say for October caddis, I would still be fishing uh, lighter setups, that commando head, in hopes of, yeah, skating up a, a dry fly fish uh, with that October caddis. So really the only time I would fish a heavy, heavy, heavy tip here in Missoula on a freestone would be winter time. Yeah. Yeah. When you get, okay. Gotcha. And where are you, and for the steelhead, where it sounds like you've been around the West, where do you, um, I know the runs have been a little bit down. Have you, have you been out fishing or have you, where's been your focus in the West for steelhead? Yeah. Focus. Um, so I, I run a, a lodge in, uh, Glenwood, Washington, which is like South central Washington on the East side of Mount Adams, uh, on the Klickitat. And I've done that now for a few years. And I actually guided the Klickitat since 2015, 16. Hmm. Can't remember. <laughs> yeah. um, oh wow! So you've been. So yeah, I didn't realize. Yeah, you're on the click. What, and yeah. what's the um, what's the lodge called? Uh, it's through Red's Fly Shop, but the lodge is the Flying L Lodge. Um, it was completed. the The lodge itself was completed in 1946. It's super cool. Uh, Glenwood is population, I think, 85, and the actual town itself. It's in the middle of nowhere, but it's awesome. It's at the headwaters. It's up towards. I don't know if you're familiar with the click tat up towards the hatchery. I am. Um, yeah, I am. I, that's cool. Yeah. We haven't talked about the click attack in a while, but no, it's awesome. Yeah. So you're, so you're out there. Were you out there, um, this, uh, this last season here? Yeah. Literally just got back to Montana, um, t- a week and a half ago, two weeks ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Crazy. <laughs> yeah. How, so how was the, how was the season? How, how were the runs? Uh, run was healthy for sure. Uh, season was great. Uh, we had, yeah, we had a great season, great crew, um, and, you know, great customers and yeah, healthy return of fish for sure. Wow. Does it feel like, because, you know, there's been all the last few years, how the runs have been down around the whole Pacific Rim. Mm-hmm. Do, do, have you been, I mean, was there a couple of years there where things were rough or what, what does that, or was the click attached just a little different than everything else? Um, no, I, I mean, we... This is this was our first year back um, since 2019. COVID aside, uh, you know we've completely reworked our entire program to be centered around uh, the fishing. Uh, and what I mean by that is numbers wise, right? We're not going out and trying to catch every last fish in the river. We're, we've kind of built things this year to be more about the full experience. Um, so instead of going out and, you know, quote unquote, limiting out, right. Like, oh yeah, we went, Mm -hmm. you know, eight for 10 today or whatever, you know, uh, we're again, trying to more so impart, um, just how special it is to go out and actually touch one of those fish. Um, and especially in the click attack, I mean, I, I'm such a sucker for that river. (laughs) It's so special, uh, Mm -hmm. at the you know, for listeners that aren't familiar with it, at the, the mouth of the click tat, there's narrows. So there's the knife gorge that is impassable. I mean, there's no one has ever lived. <laughs> trying, oh, right. You know, it's, it's white water, big can, deep canyon. I mean, it is, Google it. It's incredible. Um, and to think that these fish come up, you know, they've already gone quite possibly to the coast of Japan and back in the Pacific Ocean. Then they come up the Columbia and then they hang a left and they go up these narrows that are just unbelievable. I mean, the basalt rock, the white water, the, you name it. So, and it's glacially fed water too. So it's incredibly cold. <laughs> and so they make it up these narrows and then for us to, you know, float down the river and find one, I mean, it's, it's just, it's just an exceptional experience. So we've, we've really focused more on that. So yes, we, we did not go back, um, due to low returns. Uh, ethically, I didn't feel that it was the responsible thing to do. Um, and now with returns bouncing back, it's looking very healthy. Uh, by no means do I feel that this is, uh, a long-term option, so to speak for, for guiding. 
But, you know, I, I do feel comfortable and I'm, you know, I'll keep reassessing year after year, depending on the, the returns. But yeah, this year I felt totally great with going back and it was, oh, it was so good to be back. I love that room. Right. So you took a couple of years off and then you're back in, what is the operation running the lodge? So, and it was the, reminds me, it's the Flying L Lodge? Yeah. Yes. And that's Reds. I, we had, yeah. uh, we did a Reds. Um, I'm trying to think now what number it was, but uh, we had uh, the big, uh, uh, who's the, who's the guy, the, the big guy who's always on all the videos and stuff. He's doing a good job over there. Joe. Yeah, Joe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had, yeah, yeah. We had Joe on. We had Joe on a while back, and it was yep. it was a really good episode. He's yeah. So Joe, man, he, that guy's uh, super knowledgeable, right? Do you see Joe yeah. quite a bit, or do you, do you talk to him quite a bit? Oh yeah, yep. Joe yeah. and Steve. Um, I'm in contact more with Steve, um, who is his partner, managing partner. Okay, Joe's. Yeah, yeah. Joe Rotter, and it was episode 186. We had him on. We talked when, about gosh. the, the blue and yeah. gold flat. That was like uh, that was quite a while, while ago, actually, a couple of years ago. I was going to say, yeah, I looked through your whole roster of, of folks yeah. and, oh man, yeah. Yeah, we've had a, we've had a, <laughs> we've, we're doing about two or three times as much uh, content as most others out there. So it's, yeah, when I look around, awesome. I see 186 seems like a long time ago, but it was only February. It was, oh, well, I guess we're almost two years since we had Joe on. Oh, that's awesome. Which is crazy because that seems like it was yesterday. You know how that goes, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. No, Red's, oh. Love them. They're, yeah, they're they're doing a great job, aren't they? They got they yes. got all the stuff going with the trout. They got their they got even some hunting, right? They're doing their oh, it seems like tons. they're really leading the way out there. Oh, tons. And I oh Reds, they're like our second family. We have mm-hmm. nothing but gushing reviews to say about everyone there. They're highly recommend them. <laughs> right on. Well, let's take yeah. it back to the click tag because this is yeah. a good one. So the click is kind of a you know, it's not the clear water, it's not the Deschutes, it's a little smaller stream, but it's it's really unique and cool. What is the setup you're using there for the steelhead? Are you guys just swinging um, just dry, bigger rods and stuff there? Bigger, I mean, bigger being seven weights. Nothing, the click attack's not that, it's not that big of a river, uh, you know, width-wise. Um, so I'm swinging, uh, I don't know, with like 30, yeah, yeah, yeah seven weight, nothing, no eight weights, certainly not branching into, uh, you know, winter rods or anything like that. Yeah. Um, and what's the line you're using for those? I still swing. I swing mostly a groove there, um, simply just to, to get down. Um, although you can <laughs> occasionally, uh, try to skate a dry fly, on the click attack or a lot of the Columbia drainage for that matter. Um, I, my greatest success skating for summer run steelhead has always been the grand Ron. I mean, I think there's a lot of anglers that would say the same. Um, they're very trouty, so to speak, by the time they make it all the way up to the, the grand Ron, um, drainage. So they're a little bit more, uh, friendly perhaps, I guess is what you might want to mm. call it. Um, to, to eating a skated fly, but that's, that's definitely speaking on my behalf, my greatest success swinging dries. But anyways, yeah. Wow. This is cool. So yeah, it, on the, and then you're fishing like the commando out there for these. Uh, so I'm just thinking, so the groove is going back to that. So you got the commando groove is the dual mm-hmm. density float yes. intermediate. The smooth is just the full floating. So you're using more on the click, more of the groove or you're kind of the, the, um, the dual density. Yeah. Yeah. Just to ensure that I'm getting my fly down to where I want it to be. Um, not that the click attack where I'm swinging or again, this is going to like any of the Columbia river drainages, uh, the rivers that I'm fishing out there. Um, with the exception of the grand Ron, cause I'll fish a floating line and a skated dry out, out there any day of the week. But, um, you know, more of like the Deschutes, Um, I'll occasionally go and swing like the white salmon, which is just the neighbor to the, the click attack. And I, I do prefer more often than not to, yes, swing a a dual density line simply to ensure that I know my fly is down, uh, versus, you know, me having to really manipulate my line, meaning, you know, say casting more back upstream, giving it a huge mend with a floating line and even like stepping with my cast, uh, to, to 
really sink it down. I know with a dual density head, I'm kind of working smarter, not harder, I guess. Yeah, I gotcha. Yeah. It's just helping, yeah, break the surface a little bit, get down. Yeah, and, exactly. And then if you wanted to do, are you guys doing any uh, like surface dries for, for steel on the click? You can. <clears throat> it's very, um, very hit or miss. I mean, there are, there are October caddis. Um, again, even in the whole Columbia drainage, I mean, the Deschutes, um, I fished the Deschutes, worked on the, Desch the Deschutes, the John Day, um, the Grand Ron. Oh, love mm -hmm. that river. And yeah. Yes, you can. It's just not, I think with it being glacially fed, it, you're not going to have the best of success. There gotcha. are there are other rivers, if you're looking to get a swung fish on a dry, there are other rivers that are far friendlier, I would say. That would be my two cents mm -hmm. on that. Yeah. Okay. So basically, it, yeah, you're swinging for summer steelhead out on the click tad and then you're just fishing. What, what's your fly? What's your go-to fly if you're out there, uh, you know, or what fly do you use this summer? What, what was the first one you're putting on there? Uh, I fished a home tie by our buddy, Derek, and it was just a simple intruder <laughs> and it was mm -hmm. all black. <laughs> yep. Black, black, any flash? Nope. <laughs> no. Was it, was it a, like a two station sort of thing or that sort of deal? No, it was the most no. basic thing ever. And just a wet fly, essentially a little yeah. like a traditional wet fly, like a black body with some yarn or something like that. It had, well, I know there was marabou. Um, gosh, I can't even, now I can't even picture it in my head. But anyways, it was super simplistic. Uh, and yeah, I always have confidence in black. And it's it's super, again, being glacially fed, you can throw the kitchen sink on the click a tad essentially you know it, it's all mm. water clarity dependent it can be super super off color i mean it can absolutely puke right the glacier uh, <laughs> the glacier can absolutely ruin that entire river from a fishing standpoint yeah. um you know coffee with a little bit of cream color all the way to once it starts to really hard freeze on the mountain um crystal clear. I mean, it's like you can almost see to the other side of the earth. Uh, so I, I base whatever color I'm fishing on the water clarity. And then two, as the age old saying goes, whatever you have confidence in. Yeah. Yeah. Use that one. Oh yeah. Use that one. Yep. Nice. So right, right on. Well, this is good. I'm glad you dug into the click attack because that is a cool river and you guys have a lodge, which I didn't even realize. Yeah. There was a, the lodge out there and, um, so that's good. Well, what's going on with your, so you have that basically the summertime, you come up what in kind of, uh, June getting ready for that lodge. When, when do you start the large program or when, when do you get up here? I, we transition over to Washington in early September actually. So I'm guiding. Oh, oh wow. Yep. It's, it's a really wham bam <laughs> season out there. Gotcha. Um, September all the way through Thanksgiving. Um, oh, okay. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, it's a later. Yep. Gotcha. Okay. Later right, season. Right. So what is going on? So September, so July, August, right? There's fish, but I guess it's just the more you go towards the fall, the more fish that are going to be in there. Yeah. And again, being glacially fed in the summertime, unless you, unless you are based there, it's a crapshoot <laughs> with it being yeah. glacially fed. If you have a really yep. hot day, uh, you know, it's going to be off color more often than not. And gotcha. the click has gone through some transitional uh, water use over the years. I would say in the last, what's it been? Six, five, hmm, maybe even sooner than that, uh, where there was water rights up on the Glenwood side. So up towards, you know, the hatchery mm -hmm. yep. where there is no longer now water being drawn out of the big muddy, which... I mean, the name says, says it all. So there's a lot more sediment being deposited in the river throughout the year coming directly off of Mount Adams because the Klickitat actually heads out of the Goat Peak Wilderness, which is kind of actually comes off of Mount Rainier um, off the backside. So as it all comes down, the Big Muddy is one of the largest or larger tributaries 
of the Klickitat. And with that water no longer being drawn out in the summertime, it's just depositing silt and sediment, and it really pukes the river out a lot, a lot more than in the past. I mean, I even remember 2016, even 2017, um, you know, you could fish July, August, and have those windows where you'd have fishable water, whereas now it's a little harder to, to predict, so to speak. So mm, I see. Yeah. Okay. So September, so you're there September, October. So you got three good months there during the, the prime time mm-hmm. on that. And then you, yeah. And then once that wraps up, I guess you come back to Montana and then are, are you doing some fishing over the winter there? What, what does the winter once it starts getting cold look like there? Yeah. Um, we, we, being my husband and I, we, uh, host trips to the salt water, which is a nice break, uh, you know, from being snowed in here in Montana and we're headed to Ascension Bay in late January, which will be super fun. And we will then head to Puerto Rico, Cuba. And so we'll keep busy. That'll be more 2024. We were <laughs> hoping for a Skagit sock season this year um, mm-hmm. to continue the the quest for steelhead. But um, that's kind of up in the air this year just with returns. And again, it's kind of that... I don't know, guiding ethical principle of, I don't know. So uh, that I think regardless, we will be steelheading on the coast more than likely if returns are looking healthy enough for us to make the journey out there just for fun. And then really our guide season here kicks off in mid-March and we love it. Oh, wow. Yeah, we love it too. You know, come February, as soon as it starts to warm up, uh, the fishing, you know, no one's no one's here. We can sneak out and, you know, throw a, a raft down a really snowy bank and go go fish mm-hmm. for fun and yeah. That's cool. And, so six months. So you got so you're so you got six months pretty much in Montana and then it sounds like the rest of the time you're out traveling or, or fishing like click a tad. How how do you like that? Yeah. Does it Does it feel like you're gone six months, half of the year? Do you like the travel? Is that something you want to keep doing more of? Yeah. I mean, I, I love it. It's, um, yeah, I feel super fortunate to have the ability to, to do this. Uh, and I'll do it as, as long as I can for sure. And in the off season, um, I work in conservation as well and for various nonprofits. So it's, uh, yeah, I feel great, super fortunate. I get to do everything i have my cake and i eat it too <laughs> that's right yeah. yeah we we had uh we had jeff courier on recently and he he was talking about how i mean the covid stopped right he's he's i think he's got the the 400 species actually i think he's up at 430 he's caught 430 species now on the fly but we were talking about how you know he's now because of covid it made him settle down he didn't travel to like 13 times to 13 different countries and he was like wow this is actually feels pretty good you know and obviously he's he's a lot older than you yeah. are and stuff like that but um you know it's one of those things where i think that when you when you're healthy and stuff right you don't notice the travel but as you get a little older you probably start to yeah. so it's probably good that you, you get it in now right while you're you're good to go exactly yeah yep yeah yolo right <laughs> yeah nice yeah Today's episode is sponsored by Zag.Fish, who was founded with the idea of finding ethical solutions to fly tying products and services. They've done just that by creating jobs for marginalized people, both in the U.S. and abroad. They've got uh, everything covered. We've had a recent episode on with uh, John Grosta, who talked about uh, some of the great products they have with the, the fishing he does in Florida. Uh, with the Fairflies brushes. They've got the 5D brushes and their uh, fly fur, which is pretty amazing. Tons of people are loving this stuff for its durability and the speed that allows you to tie flies. John talked about that on the podcast, uh, and he said that just uh, basically it's going to add on at least 15 to 20 minutes to uh, each fly you tie if you're not using these brushes. Zag also has uh, Wasatch custom angling tools in their satchel with over 50 uh, custom heirloom tools that go along with your materials. So they are a true do-it-yourself company, and you got to check out zag.fish right now. If you want to, you can head over to wetflyswing.com slash zag, 
and you can get 20% off your first order by clicking through that link and uh, let them know you heard uh, of them through this podcast and you'll get that 20% discount right now. That's wetflyswing.com slash Zag, Z-A-G. Okay, back to the show. Right on. Well, this is this is good. So, um, and then Montana, t- take us to the guiding a little bit of Montana. So you're fishing, you mentioned the three big rivers. Are, are you, you know, what does that look like? If somebody wanted to hit you up for a guide trip, um, what do you cover? It sounds like you, you cover dries, wet flies, knit. Do you guys kind of do it all? Yeah, um, I would say 98% of the time I'm fishing a dry dropper um, out of my boat. I rarely um, also come to a bobber in high water situations when when I have to I certainly will um, but yeah we we do it all uh, we have great fishing here out of Missoula there's something for everyone uh, and all three of our big rivers here are completely different you know characteristically uh, and have something yeah, to provide everyone. We have brown trout, bull trout, not on all of our rivers, but uh, cutthroat, rainbow, uh, whitefish. It's it's a pretty special place. I I really enjoy it. Are people coming up from around the country going, staying like at a lodge and fishing with you for a week or is it more kind of day trip stuff? What does that look like? Yeah, it's more day trip oriented. Missoula is an awesome town too. It's a college town. Uh, there's plenty of great food. And usually our program is, is I'll just pick folks up from their hotel. Most folks will stay downtown because it's within walking distance to, you know, our great steakhouse or El Camino. It's a fantastic um kind of Spanish infusion bar and restaurant. And so anyways, folks can go out, have a great meal at night. And then, you know, the next day I'll get a fantastic lunch from Market on Front, our local delicatessen, and I'll pick them up and then we'll go fishing for the day in either direction, any direction really. (laughs) And then I drop them off and then wash, rinse, repeat. And usually I would say on average folks fish about three days out here in Montana and Mm-hmm. Yeah. Gotcha. So they come up. So pretty much you, you're you there for the guiding and then they just figure out their itinerary, where they're staying. They can kind of figure that all. Is there any any tips there of finding out, you know, whether I guess some people are probably camping too, right? Oh, definitely. Yep. Uh, and, you know, for all of that, I and let me preface it too. I, I'm not an outfitter here in Montana, so I don't book the trip. I don't take the money, all that. I work with um, Missoula on the fly is my number one outfitter here. Uh, okay. Jordan Von Ruden and Anthony Von Ruden, two fantastic people. So they, they deal with all the money part, but I am more yep. than happy, you know, whoever would like to go fishing with me, I'm more than happy to, you know, set you up with Jordan and all that jazz. And then, uh, you know, I'm happy to, if you want to go camping, suggest some spots, uh, figure out logistics of like where I'll pick you up drop you off kind of thing. Or if there's fishing like, Hey, yeah, go camp up the Blackfoot. You can wade fish. I'll pick you up. We'll go fish a different section of it. And then I can drop you back off. Um, or to lodging, um, downtown, you know, uh, restaurant recommendations, all that. So it's, yeah, there's, there's something for everyone in, in Missoula, not just from the fishing standpoint. So Right. You got a little, how do you, how do you balance like the expectations? So they're going through an outfitter, then they come to you, you know, so they know what they, right. People are coming in sometimes or they might be thinking, right. They're getting some giant brown trout versus, you know, do you give them a little talk before you get on the boat or what does, you know, what does that look like? Oh, certainly. I mean, Jordan, you know, in communication with, with clients does, Jordan and most all other outfitters that deal on a day-to-day basis with clients, uh, new clients, so to speak, they all do a fantastic job of really setting expectations for folks. Um, Of course, there are some that always slip through the cracks and yes, then they do get in the, the truck and yeah, where's my 24 inch brown trout? I'm like, well, yeah, (laughs) yeah, let's, uh, we're every day I strive for that and I would love to see one today. So let's give her, Mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, I, I always, um, touch base with clients the night before and talk to them about their skill level, like what they're looking to get out of the day and, you know, kind of just talk, 
talk to them, just communicate and yeah, try to set that expectation bar at a realistic level. Yep. Which is if somebody was really interested in coming up and getting one with a trout spay, you know, a nice brown trout, where, where would be the place? Where would you be? If somebody had like all summer long, they could go up there. You know, what trip would you recommend for that? If they get a good chance at a big brown on a, on a spay swing. Whew, big brown. Um, or do you guys fish? I mean, are there is are you kind of equal browns and rainbows, or or is it maybe, or can you select, or is it more like you're swinging and whatever hits it, sort of thing? Yeah, here it's it's a mixed bag. I mean, you can hook up with, uh, I mean, you know, your guess is as good as mine, kind of thing. Um, but you know, I would say there are watersheds that. Yes, and and sections of each watershed that have higher concentrations of fish, uh, like for what you're looking to target, like brown trout, for example, um, or you know big rainbows, or predominantly cutthroat, West Slope cutthroat. So yeah, we can kind of curtail around that, um, and then in terms of swinging, that would definitely again go back to the time of the year. That would be very dependent, and then. You know, for us here on the on free stones, um, that would kind of limit our options, but by no means is it not doable. So I would say, going back to the brown trout scenario, if they wanted to try to swing a brown trout, I would say probably, let me think about that for a second, springtime on mm -hmm. the bitterroot. Mm -hmm. Or then I would go to the other side and say fall on the Blackfoot. Um, okay. Brown, uh, brown trout spawn in the fall and become yeah. active. That, yeah, that would kind of be my thinking in that. And then springtime on the, the Bitterroot, that's the, uh, our first river around here to really warm up. So those fish become active first. Uh, and it's pretty famous for the, the squala hatch, but uh, the swinging can be really darn good as well. So it's kind of a sleeper okay. uh, <laughs> right. around here. So, yeah. What's the, is there a hatch during the year that you really get excited about? Sounds like the squala is like the, the kind of the early one. You got the salmon flies, you got the, like the October caddis. What about all the fine, the, yes. fi the you know, like the mayfly stuff? Do you, yes. are you pretty, is that something you have dialed in? <laughs> yes, that's, yes, I not to rag on them, but I mean, salmon flies, like, yeah. been there. It, it brings the people in, but <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's like kind of a wild, it's a wild west out there, isn't it? Ugh, been there, done that. I don't know. I, yeah. I love it. I actually, I prefer fishing golden stones to salmon flies. Um, uh -huh. kind of like the, the little forgotten sister. Um, yeah, is the golden stones, do they kind of come out? I mean, they're kind of during the same time, but do they come out like earlier or later or what's that, what's that look like up there? Yeah, they coincide. Salmon flies generally hatch just, they coincide with our high water, uh, which would be like, call it temperature depending. Um, I would say mid May and then golden stones will start right around the same time, but I don't know, for safe measure, call it late May. So there's just a bit of overlap um, with a delay and then golden stones and shoot salmon flies. We saw salmon flies in the Canyon of the Blackfoot this year until July, I think it was like 12th or something. It's some ridiculous, it, it was crazy, but a late hatch for us this year. And, and I didn't really see many golden stones, but years past, I mean, I remembered, you know, we'd have golden stones all the way through mid July. Um, and I really, yeah, I really do love throwing, golden stones. I just, I feel like they're kind of an underrated, uh, hatch, but for me, I love small mayfly fishing. I love mm -hmm. the trico hatch. Um, All right. I love PMD fishing. It's really technical. It's hard. You're going to get your ass kicked, <laughs> but man, it is so rewarding. Um, and I love the lower Clark fork and fishing downstream of Missoula. Um, it's really technical fishing, but if you have the right people with the right attitude and, you know, the skill set, it can be like some of the most rewarding trout fishing. Right. Oh. So you're floating down and are you doing this out of a, a drift boat or are you floating the rivers for the most part? Yeah. Yeah. Like a, like a little skiff or a, a normal kind of bigger drift boat. Uh, I have a 16 foot, uh, low sided eddy. 
And then I also have a raft for, um, you know, we have oh, okay. white water options. I have a Sotar strike. Oh, okay. Yeah, as well. Yep. Yeah. And you got the, so, and the, and the raft is that, is that Klaka craft, the Eddie, the big Eddie? The Eddie. Yeah. Or is that what that is? Yeah. Yeah. And I have a, it's Klaka. yep. Klaka. Yep. And it's a low sided, it's, it's a, not quite a big Eddie, but, um, yeah, low sided boat. And, um, yes. And then the raft for high water here, uh, we do have white water out of Missoula options for fishing as well. You know, some rapids all the way down to like splash and giggle stuff. And then, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's really great. Uh, having two boats really gives you the option of going and doing literally whatever you want as a guide, um, yeah. which is really nice. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just, I'm looking at the, um, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So it's, so basically, yeah, the Eddie is a standard drift boat, right? It's got the normal, it's got the pointed bow, right? Yeah. It's not, it's not flat on. Yeah. So it's a normal drift boat. It's just low, super low sides. Yes. Right? Yeah. Gotcha. Do you see a mixture of, um, yeah, I guess in Montana, you still see more of the traditional drift boats, right? You, do you see many of those, like the square, you know, like, what do they call those? They're kind of the skiff sort of thing, right? Oh, yeah. Or I don't know if it's... A, yeah. Yeah, you see a lot of those. Oh, yeah. Um, Adipose is... Yeah, Adipose, yeah. Based out of Helena. So um, that is the predominant boat that you'll see, like, on the Missouri, for example, just outside of Helena, where I'm from. Um, you'll see the those skiff-styled boats, uh yeah. yeah. And then I'd say That's Missoula right. is really a mixed bag. Um, yeah. Mixed bag. Cause you have some white water that you need to go through. Yeah. You can choose. I know quite a few guides here in Missoula that have just, just drift boats or just rafts mm -hmm. for that matter. Cause you can take a raft anywhere, but you can't take a drift boat everywhere. Right. So yeah, it's, it's really great in the sense of versatility to have both, but you can definitely in mm -hmm. Missoula, get away with having just a raft but i would say in a high water scenario you know yes uh, for those that own just drift boats i think it would be difficult you would really have to pick and choose where you go floating in high water i i love my raft i've had it forever and uh mm. yeah the sotars are cool they're the yeah. super it's almost like a drift boat. They're so hard, right? The really hard shell on the outside of the raft. Yeah, and it's, it's poly. It's made out of some special, right? Polypropylene, I, it, uh, I think, is. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, I yep. I love it. indestructible, and I mean, it's like a Toyota, right? I could go and sell that thing for probably more than what I paid for it these days. That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Wow. Okay. So you're going down. So if you're in the drift boat, floating the lower uh, river um, and hitting some of those small mayflies you got a guy kind of on the front and the back and are you just kind of back rowing, looking for rising fish? You probably know where some of the spots are, but how does that look? Like if somebody's out there in their own boat drifting down with a couple of buddies in the boat, you know, how do they find those fish if you're doing the tactical stuff? Yeah, you'd definitely have to be on the lookout for sure. It's very spot oriented. Um, I mean, these fish are nomadic though. They will move to where you know, these mayflies are hatching from, I mean, sometimes in the lower Clark Fork, it'll just be a blanket of, of fish. So, I mean, anybody's guess, right. And some of these really large, st you know, still, still non-moving, well, they're still moving, but, um, bodies of water, we call them like lakes, right. The lower Clark Fork is a pretty, uh, Oh, pretty stag not stagnant, yeah. but not as, it's, yeah, low, yeah. low gradient. Right. So, Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, you just gotta, you have to be on the lookout and be very, yeah, like you said, tactical about it. Be very methodical and try to just do your best in targeting these fish, you know, stay above them, uh, reach casts, who's ever rowing, you know, really work with the angler if you make a nice cast, you know, as the rower, try to be as quiet as possible and try to then keep up with the drift at a very long distance at, you know, a 45 degree angle so that your angler can actually get a hook set versus like straight down on them. Uh, be cognizant of how the fish is actually eating, like actually study the fish. If, if you have a, 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 a fish and it is continuously eating in a pattern, notice you know, is it eating every four seconds or five seconds? Count one Mississippi hmm. and try to time mm -hmm. it. And 
notice, you know, do I need to get a reach cast to the left, to the right? Really calculate it all through before even making a cast. More often than not, you know, if you go at it guns blazing, <laughs> yeah. it you're missing one component of that that greater picture. And it is, again, one of the most rewarding things if you can sit there and, oh, okay, that time it was, you know, four Mississippi turns down and then try to think about it. That fish is going to start to come up on four Mississippi. I need to reach cast to the right and then boom, it is. Yeah. Mm, I geek out on that. It's, it's my, it's, oh, that's it. And, <laughs> and being a guide out there all, you know, every day, you're kind of getting a dialed in on the hatches. You kind of get all the timing. And where, where does somebody go if they want to learn about the hatches? Like if they were, say, fishing that section of river and wanted to know what they're what to put in their fly box, you know, what would you recommend? Who should, any resources or places they could check that out? Oh, yeah. Many of our fly shops. We have four fly shops here in town. Um, and, you know, they're all great. They're all, I would mm-hmm. say, look them all up. Yeah. Is the grizzly hackle still in, in Missoula? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, grizzly hackle. Yeah, that that was one we've been, we've been to a long time ago. We used to do some trips out there. Yeah, so that's still there. That's cool. Oh, that's yeah. one of the older ones, right? They've been around a while. Yep, the grizzly hackle, the Kingfisher fly shops. Actually, I believe. Don't quote me on this. I think it's the oldest. the ha- The hackle could be the oldest, mm-hmm. or the fisher. And then, in addition to that, there's the Missoulian angler, and then there's Blackfoot River outfitters. And I would say, you know, look them all up. Um, or visit them all. I mean, spread the love for small businesses. And they're all fabulous, all have good staffing. Um, I know each and every one of the owners and most all the staff and have nothing but great things to say about them. And yeah, go go around. And if you want to really, yeah, get things dialed too, I would, I hate, to, I'm not trying to self-promote, but I would say, hire hire a guide <laughs> you know in, in the right. sense oh yeah if you really if you really truly want to get proficient at something uh as as particular as you know throwing small dry flies or or two spay casting swinging flies um and you really want to learn nuances to it you don't even necessarily have to book a guide day but maybe hire a guide for a, a day of instruction um and really get your money's worth and start off on on the right foot too. So there's plenty of resources, mm-hmm. fly shops, um, yeah. instructors, guides. Yeah. Right. Yep. All of that. Yeah. No, that is always, I think the best advice is, yeah, if you're coming up there, even if you had a drift boat, had all your stuff dialed in, you know, I think it would be fi- get a guide for a day and then you can f- kind of be like, okay, now you got a little section, right. You can learn and learn something about the hatches, casting, like all of that. Right. It's pretty awesome. Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. What, what's the, um, uh, we're going to be taken out here pretty quick, but I just wanted to, you know, again, going back on the river, um, you know, so you have a lot going on, right? You got the dry, you got the, the swinging, you got the dries, you got steelhead, you know, throughout the year. Um, and you got the travel prime I mean, you got a lot of this going on. Do you find, um, you know, the trout fishing is like, if you had to do one thing, your bread and butter, is that kind of where it goes back to? Or do you kind of struggle with that between like, if steelhead was steelhead versus trout, like what is your, what's your take there? Um, man, that's like Sophie's choice right there. Um, that's a tough one, isn't it? <laughs> I would say, um, God, you know, I don't know if I actually could make yeah. a decision. And you're guiding, right? And you guide both on e- equally, right? So, I mean, you're kind of splitting your time. I mean, to, I mean, I, steelhead is so addicting, right, for people that have done it. But trout is also addicting, right? Especially, you know, you oh, got, yeah. it depends on what you're doing, right? Yeah. But I mean, just the dry fly stuff. I mean, that's a difficult, challenging way to fish to match the hatch. Um, I, I'm t- I'm torn as well. I mean, I think it's a hard question because I'm thinking like, okay, if I was going to go go to Missoula right now, what would I love to focus on? And I would love to actually get my dry fly game, you know, cued in a little bit better. Yeah, you know, at this point in time, I. I would have to say steelhead simply from the standpoint of longevity. I don't think that, you know, the future of those fish is long for this world. So I want to be there and in that area of the world at the lodge, you know, the whole the whole kit and caboodle. Uh, white salmon is our, our closest, you know, quote unquote, big town, Hood River. I, 
I love it there so much. Um, and I miss it already. I can't wait to be back. I, I think that just the, I know that there's a, a finite future for me there. Yeah. And that's just because of Steelhead. You feel like Steelhead is for the long term might not be doing as well as say trout species. Yeah. I would say yes. In, yeah. On the, on a time scale, I think that Steelhead absolutely have lesser time here than, than trout do. Not that our trout are perfect off by any means. I mean, they have yeah. their own adversity and challenges in and of themselves, but you know, I, I would say that I would just kind of want to go there and, and be there for a longer period of time right now just to, to relish in it and just to, it sounds so depressing, but kind of see it off, so to speak, in the next, you know, decade or so. Right. Um, yeah, it's it's really a crazy, it is kind of crazy to think of, right? Because it is, steelhead do have challenges. You know, like I said at the start, you know, we were over in Ohio, which is very interesting because the Great Lakes, and I don't know all the background there, but you know, obviously steelhead were planted there. But I mean, we had we had a, an epic, exceptional trip, right? I would never have thought going to Ohio, I would have, and I fished steelhead all over the West, right, and Skeena and stuff, and but I can just be honest and say, like, wow, it is pretty damn amazing. You know, these Great Lakes fish coming out there, they were all chrome bright. You know, they were all chromers. They were, you know, you were good. I had, I had a couple of fish that like hit it tip tap, right? Full multiple chases. Um, and so it's really interesting because, you know, you got that. So they seem to be doing well out there, but this West Coast thing is not doing as well. And, uh, but then you also hear about some people, you know, Jeff or uh, Brian Niska was talking about some of the runs, the ups and downs, and how he was saying that, you know, he, he's a little more optimistic on where things are going. And yeah, so, so nobody, nobody really knows, but I will keep it fun and say the steelhead battle question, like steelhead versus trout for you. I asked Jeff or um, Stuart Foxel recently, his steelhead versus Atlantic salmon. And what do you think he said? You know, he's actually from England. And I, oh. I said, if you had to choose one Atlantic salmon versus steelhead, what do you think? Do you know Stuart at all? I don't. Oh yeah. Okay. So he's like, um, he's basically out in England. He ties for like aqua flies, but he's been like couch surfing out in the Skeena region for a number of years. Right. So he knows steelhead, but he chose steelhead. Same thing, you know, like he, and I don't know, I can't remember his exact answer. Point being is that steelhead are this amazing fish. And I think everybody gets their amazing fish and it's same thing for me. It just, it kind of lights me up. Um, so, well, you got travels Agreed. coming. Give us a heads up before, as we head out of here, what, where, what is your one, you look at your salt stuff, you know, if, let's just go there. If you had to pick one trip for salt, which one, what species are you going for there? Oh man, God, these are hard questions. <laughs> All right, have you, and now let me take it back because I haven't caught a lot of salt species and I, I'm excited to get more into it, but have you caught like everything? Or are you more like kind of, you've got a few really on the bucket list you like you want to get? Um, I, I have had the privilege that, that, yes, I've been lucky enough to catch quite a few species. Um, check them off the list. I would say the one fish that I would love, going back to the, the beginning of the podcast, uh, uh, the one fish I would love to get on the fly would be a marlin. And my dad, when I was, you know, the whole, when I was nine, that whole story, my dad, after he landed that fish, well, now it's in my parents' house, this 12 foot, you know, um, replica of this marlin lives at their house and in the hallway. <laughs> it's obtrusive and it's hilarious. And not only that, he, my dad got a full colored tattoo on his entire forearm um, of the fish. And anyway, so I would love to wow. get a marlin on the fly so that yeah. I too can continue our family tradition of getting a <laughs> full color tattoo. <laughs> oh, wow. So you have a, so you have a tattoo idea. I do. I just need to get the fish oh, first and then also so get awesome. a, a replica of it as well. So yes, a marlin on a fly and a Pacific Mar blue, fly. not a, not a black, a Pacific blue marlin. Yes. That's my goal. So basically I was thinking like out of the marlin and we had, um, we did a sailfish episode with Jake Jordan and he talked about that whole thing it was episode, um, 204, um, just for like billfish and stuff and things. But where would you go for Marlin? Do you have an idea where you'd be going? Uh, I would like to go back to the big island of Hawaii just to follow in yeah. <laughs> my cat's footsteps and see if I can replicate it. Right. Yeah. So go to yeah Hawaii and that's always a good place to go. Yeah. 
uh, for Pacific Blue. And, you know, past that, well, and to be honest, I haven't really done much research outside of Hawaii for Pacific Blues, but I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure there's better or, you know, just as equally as productive places to go as well. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Cool. All right. Well, we'll, we'll keep that. So you got a good bucket list one there. And uh, and one more random one. We're going to get out of here. But uh, so, Ed, you, you're OPST, right? You're still... It sounds like, do you use OPST, like everything? Do they actually have the dry... They don't really have the dry... You know, they're all kind of swinging stuff, right? What, what are you using for your dry fly stuff, your other the trout stuff? Yeah, trout stuff, guiding-wise. Um, I run SA lines in the boat and yeah, yeah run all... Um, G Loomis rods. I'm an ambassador for them as well. And yeah, for single hand stuff in the boat. Yeah. Yep. Perfect. Yep. So Loomis and two, two great and SA that's in there. Awesome as well. So yeah. cool. All right. And, and so Ed, so Ed, have you met the, the met the big guy? Have you ever run, met Ed, the, um, the mastermind behind the OPSD? You know, I have not had the pleasure of meeting him in person yet. It's, yeah. But you've talked to him. Yes. We're trying to, we're trying to, well, I mean, it's been in the works. I don't know. It, it's like two ships passing in the night, I think, uh, in terms of scheduling and yeah. Sure, okay. sure. No, I just, I always wonder about that because we haven't had him on yet. And I think he's just, he, you know, he likes to stay kind of quiet, low key. And, uh, but he's such a, you know, he's such a, the person behind, right? So many stories and, and we've talked a lot about, you know, we've had a lot of his friends on. You know, we've talked stories about Ed, but uh, so I'm, I'm keeping my fingers crossed that someday we'll, we'll get him on here directly from him as well. Um, oh, yeah. He's a, yeah, he's a figure in the, I mean, he's part of Spay history, right? He'd be yeah, yeah. awesome to have yeah, on. Yeah, he's, I mean, all this, this compact stuff, right? It all started out with pretty much those guys doing their thing. Yep. You know, probably not too far from where you're fishing in Washington, right? Up, up north there. Yeah, legitimately, yeah. Right on. Well, we'll send, uh, yeah, everybody out uh, to ksguideservice.com uh, to connect with you. And, uh, you know, if they have any questions, I think the Trout Spay thing is awesome. It sounds like you got a full program going. And, yeah, maybe I'll, maybe we'll get out there sometime or even the, the click attack. I'm always interested. So we'll, we'll try to send some folks your way. And, um, yeah, thanks for all your time today and uh, shedding some light on the Spay. It'd be great. Thanks, Dave. I really appreciate you having me on. So there it is. Swinging into Montana over to the click tat and taking our tour around the West. Kinsley Scott, episode wetflyswing.com slash 403. We'll get you show notes and some little bonuses that we have. If you get a chance, would love if you can uh, leave a comment out there. If you have a chance to take a look at that episode, let me know if it was helpful, if that blog post was helpful over there. Wetflyswing.com slash 403. I want to give a quick listener shout out before we get out of here. Stephen Rosenfeld, uh, Stephen Rosenfeld left a comment on a blog post. This was the episode number 233, Ed Jabarowski, uh, and this was on the blog post. Uh, Stephen left a comment, and I just want to read that so you can get a feel for this one. If you haven't checked out that episode, that was an awesome one. Ed broke down the... Uh, a uh, casting. So here's what Steven said. The complete cast DVD when it first came out a number of years ago, and he purchased the Perfecting the Cast last winter. Uh, and it said, he says, heck, he even bought Simon Gosworth single-handed spay casting this summer. So I'm following the leads mentioned here in this episode. Um, but the episode really put it together. I guess we all learn different ways. And although I like to think that I can learn a lot from my own books and videos. I found this podcast and the emphasis on first principles really sank in with me. And Steven says, uh, thank you, Ed. Hey, in my 70s, thank goodness that casting is one of the few things I get better at. Thanks for checking in, Steven, for the great comment on the blog post. I am uh, very excited that this helped you. And I know casting is... Whether you're beginning or have been fishing your whole life, casting can still be a struggle. So this is what we're here for, to provide some uh, some feedback, some bonuses, some information to help uh, you and everyone else out there uh, get better and, uh, and get better at that craft. I'm going to be checking out this one again. And if you have a comment you want to leave, you can do that anytime. Uh, if I get a chance, I will read it on the uh, on the show here. Give you a shout out. Uh, you can also send me a message anytime uh, on social Wetfly Swing, and uh, and that is what we have today. 
Let's take a look ahead really quick and see what we have coming. Okay, we got a fun uh, couple of episodes here. Uh, we are going to be jumping in. Actually, we've got one we're getting into rod building, and we got uh, we got David Gravette coming on. We're going to talk skateboarding. We're going to talk skateboarding. Skateboarding and fly fishing. Uh, this one is good. We definitely uh, are going to have to put up the uh, explicit on this one uh, with David, but it was a fun one. And next week... Next week, we got a, uh, a giant one. George Cook is back with a breakdown on Alaska. Uh, and uh, and we're going uh, to give Bradley Stokes a shout out there as well on that episode. Uh, lots of good stuff to come here. We are just, um, we just rolled over 400 and, uh, and we're working our way up to 500. We are going to get there and this is going to be awesome. All right, I hope to see you maybe on the water, maybe online, and I hope you are having a good evening, a good morning, or good afternoon, wherever you are in the world, and I appreciate you for supporting this podcast and look forward to talking to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.